like I said, three minute warning and one minute warning. All right. Let me get over here, guys. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm on two different steps here, guys. Uh, so I don't block the projector. So. Go ahead. Um, so uh, hello, if you're uh, just arriving, we've uh, we've been setting up, so you haven't missed anything. Uh, my name is Dr. Liam Leonard. I'm from uh, the uh, Department of Sociology at California State University of Los Angeles. And uh, before that, I was a sociologist in Ireland for many years. And in Ireland, I trained um, corrections officers, recruit officers for the National Prison Service there. Uh, so I have an interest in all of the uh, topics around uh, training for people in uniform and that kind of thing. Uh, and so, and uh, part of what I look at in this is you know, a pretty brief presentation of uh, two very serious incidents in our recent history is, our, you know, uh, focuses on training and problems when uh, we, we don't uh, focus on training in the way that we might. So, um, is that the right one? The right arrow. All right, there we go. So the uh, the focus of the talk is two shootings. Uh, one in uh, 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 Cleveland and one in Ferguson. Uh, Michael Brown and Tamir Rice, two names that we've become familiar with through the, the tragic uh, deaths. Um, and they were both shot, uh, two unarmed youth, uh, by police officers, and both African American, both shot by white police officers. This, of course, has convulsed our society. Uh, has led to a lot of investigation and discussion about policing uh, per se. So I'm going to try to uh, tease out some of the issues as I saw them. First, in my research on the shooting with Michael Brown, uh, and second, not to realize, but I'll start with Tamir. Um, and, you know, we have the pictures there. There was a lot of discussion of Michael when he was shot, so I thought it was fitting we would have him in his, his cap and gown when he graduated high school. Uh, while he's amongst us here. Um, here's a picture now of um, Tamir Rice's mother and sister. Um, and this is the very spot where Tamir was killed. Uh, a young boy of 12 uh, playing in a playground. Um, when his uh, sister heard there was a shooting, she ran up and she was also uh, arrested, uh, handcuffed, and thrown on the ground, and so on and so forth. So. You can imagine the trauma that, that they went through. Um, so my discussion wants to uh, tease out uh, um, aspects of coverage, media coverage, and that kind of thing. That's what I focused on. Because I felt a sociologist, a criminologist, whatever, you're, you're getting your first uh, wave of information about any of these incidents through the media. That can be problematic course, as we know with our media, uh, being of a variety of, of uh, ideologies and, and uh, viewpoints and so on. Um, so I thought I would try to focus on uh, certain issues there uh, with the media as well. So um, for me, the issue is, of course, structural racism, but I say we all are at fault for what happened to these two uh, young uh, kids in our society, and so much that we're not paying attention to the issues that are important around policing, uh, including training, vetting, support, psychological support, and so on and so forth, community policing, all that kind of thing. Uh, so our initial look at these incidents, uh, you would say, oh, this officer did something terrible, uh, what was he thinking, is he a racist, and all that kind of thing. And, you know, there's, there's reason to have suspicion that there is racism at play in many of these shootings. But in addition to that, there are other issues that have to be addressed, and there's structural issues in our policing as well. Um, so in Cleveland, uh, Tamir was out playing in his playground where he always played, and he was never allowed to have a toy gun by his mother. You know, you're familiar with the story, uh, many of you. Uh, and minutes before he was shot, he was, uh, he was able to swap his, his cell phone for a toy gun. That looked very realistic. Um, and that, unfortunately, led to his death. You know? That simple uh, playground exchange. Uh, and the call went out from um, 
uh, the Cleveland Dispatcher, the uh, Cleveland Police Department Dispatcher, uh, Code 1. There's a, there's a gunman in the plate. So the Code 1 is the highest, most serious uh, call that can go out for police. So you can imagine the mindset of the officers as they respond to this call. And we've had so many tragedies, shootings in playgrounds and schools and that kind of thing, young kids shot. That their mindset as they raced to this uh, uh, crime scene, as they saw it, uh, must have been quite uh, dramatic and accelerated. Uh, and in fact, they drove straight up to Tamir, got out of their vehicle, and shot him. There was no real exchange of discussion or anything. Tamir was a tall boy for his age, he was 12, and uh, he was wearing a, a big heavy jacket because it was cold out. And, uh, but in the call, uh, the person that made the call said, there's, there's somebody with a, what looks like a gun in the playground. And, They, uh, but they're probably a, a youth, probably a young person, you know? Uh, so, but when it was relayed, it was still relayed as a code one. So, you know, the officer's mindset was set at that point. Um, the, the, the caller said it was probably a juvenile. So we have to look at how we work with dispatchers, trainers. You know, it's the first point of contact once a call goes in. And, you know, I've, I've had people, students of mine, go to the police academy. Some have gone on to be dispatchers. And and it is quite a serious job in itself. Clarity of communication becomes uh, very important. Um, the officers, uh, Garnbach and Lehman, uh, did hear it was code one, uh, highest level of urgency. Uh, they raced to the scene uh, and drove across the playground. Now, training would have that you don't do that. You don't drive your vehicle right up to someone who is brandishing a weapon uh, because the, the likelihood is that they would have been shot themselves. Um, so of course, that was our second issue, tactical errors in response to the call. The third, excessive force, Tamir was shot immediately. Uh, within uh, one to three seconds is what I've uh, been able to deduce uh, from video evidence and that kind of thing, news reports. As I said, I'm working off news reports for the most part. Um, his sister came up uh, to the scene, as you saw in the photo, she was only 14, and she was immediately thrown to the ground and handcuffed. Uh, obviously, you can imagine her distress seeing her young brother killed. Um, when his mother arrived soon after, she was told to calm down or she would also be handcuffed. So the mindset of the officers was completely at odds with where they should have been uh, at that point of the, the, the incident. Problem four in Cleveland, many of our cities, there's a history of dysfunction in police. It's endemic. Uh, two weeks after Tamir's death, the Justice Department released a scathing report accusing the department of a pattern of excessive force uh, for which officers were rarely disciplined. Uh, and pressed the department to accept a federal monitor. Somebody had to come down from D.C. and sit on the department. Um, uh, a year before, they had found systemic failure across the department. So where we have that kind of problem in policing, it's not uh, surprising that we have uh, some, some of these terrible outcomes. The fifth problem uh, I came across was vetting and recruitment. Uh, it highlights the shortcomings in the department's vetting process. Layman was uh, an officer in another Ohio uh, town, and he had been discharged from the force. He broke down on the shooting range in tears. He had broken up with his girlfriend and he was in some emotional distress. So they had to come walk up to him and take the gun off and, and walk him off the shooting range and that thing. And he was asked, he wasn't fired, but he was asked to leave the force. But lo and behold, he, he applies then to uh, Cleveland and is hired without any background check whatsoever. Now, you can't get a job in the 7-Eleven without a background check. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's quite surprising. But it, it, it it shows the problem with policing in fact that most departments are severely understaffed. Most officers are severely overworked and so on and so forth. Same applies in LA. Uh, and uh, you know, these problems come of course from cutbacks. Uh, community policing as we once knew it has been eroded and uh, one of the local politicians there said uh, there used to be uh, police huts where they could stop by and they would go in and discuss things with the community. 
and they've all been removed. In fact, they've been gone for about 10 years. Uh, and he said, had they been there, they would have known Tamir, they would have gone into the playground where he played, they would have gone to the community center, got to know the local kids on their beat, that kind of thing. The kind of community policing we were familiar with in the past uh, uh, has been removed. We now have, you know, patrols and cars, helicopters, that kind of thing. People don't get into face to face with the community in the same way, unfortunately. Um, and had they seen Tamir with a, uh, a replica gun, they would have said, Tamir, what are you doing? You're going to get into trouble with that thing. So on and so forth. The problem, of course, we have a gun society. The replica gun was a, a, identical to a real gun. Uh, there had been a, a plastic side to the gun that was removed. The plastic side was orange, so you could tell it was a toy. And it had been so it looked identical to whatever make of gun it was uh, uh, supposed to be copied. And of course, that's a, that's a, a problem itself. Uh, reduced police budget, problem eight. <clears throat> uh, they had laid off up to 250 officers in the previous years. <coughs> uh, they trimmed the force 15%, uh, down to 1,500 uh, officers. I've never been to Cleveland, but I'd imagine you know, it's hard to police the city that size with so few officers. The mini stations, the substations I mentioned, were also close at that stage. Uh, of course, in the next two years, this was in 2004, in the next two years, crime you know, increased dramatically, double digits, and so on and so forth, although it evened off, off after that, and so on. So where we have cutbacks in that kind of uh, situation, uh, you're going to have serious issues. Not just the rise in crime, which of course is very serious, but the pressure that police are put under. The lack of time for training, and so on. They only get a few months in the academy, and that kind of thing. Uh, in Cleveland and in so many other places, lack of police accountability. Um, one of the local uh, uh, lawyers said, there's a culture of no consequences. Yeah, true. Uh, so no consequences uh, and a, a, a rounding of the wagons when there's a problem. Uh, and you have what's called canteen culture. Uh, you get that in many situations with military as well, uh, where people are not, and same with prisons, people are not going to put forward a complaint about one of their colleagues. From a training, as I've mentioned, in Cleveland you only need a high school diploma to join the force and that kind of thing. As someone who teaches criminal justice as well as sociology, I would argue you need some more considered training than that in a, a, in a college. In a university, the universities we have, the wonderful California State System and so on, you meet other people, people who might be different to you, who might have different experiences, different backgrounds, and you take away that hostility, hopefully, to some extent. It's one of the wonderful things about our university system. It brings people together. Rather than having the encounters in uh, such a negative situation as, as we're finding. So training of all kinds is important. Now, uh, with Michael Brown's situation, it was also a similar. Uh, there's too much on that. That's uh, the setup of what I was trying to do with the, the study. I published a report through Trivisoc, uh, which I edit. Um, and as we all know, Michael Brown was shot and killed by Darren Wilson, and really uh, the, the issues there for me from a policing point of view were a concern about militarized policing, so I'd be interested again in our other speakers, and I'll let them get on here quite quickly. Um, and immediately after the, the, the response to uh, what happened, we had uh, militarized policing in Ferguson, we're familiar with the images. And then I just mentioned also here the, uh, what's going on right now in the Keystone Pipeline dispute. The same kind of militarized response for peaceful protesters. Uh, there was, of course, all kinds of uh, uh, issues in Ferguson after the shooting. But uh, the main body of protesters tried to protect stores from getting looted and that kind of thing. But everyone was treated. Everyone was a rioter all of a sudden. And it was pretty much the same in the media. Everyone suddenly became a, a rioter. Uh, there's a history of what's going on in this country, a very brief history uh, that I tried to put together around uh, and the background to this kind of thing, which you know, we can talk about another time. So we, we have the rise of the Don't Shoot uh, movement at that stage and so on. And it's emerged ever <coughs> since. I look at the media coverage. That's a, a map of what actually happened 
and you see the distance from the patrol car to where Michael was shot, that's an apartment block lane. Mm -hmm. So there was no threat to the officer at that distance. There couldn't be, you know. Uh, Michael wasn't armed, of course. I go into the coverage of the shooting, and at the end of this, I was going to put a list of people. That was a good, good time, sorry. A <laughs> list of people, but I thought this graphic was much more uh, telling and, and, and quite tragic. These are the amount of young people, uh, young African Americans, uh, young and old, who've been killed uh, by police uh, in recent years. And this was a couple of years ago. Sadly, this is, pattern has continued. So uh, that was my examination into it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll take questions at the end if yes, the end. Yeah, we'll we'll let our speakers get on. Yes. So thank you very much. among some in gun culture, uh, supposed to sort of indicate how police are not really there when we need them, they don't, present, they don't prevent crimes necessarily. Uh, and then what I'm going to focus on are some sort of tensions and contradictions in gun culture. Um, in general, but okay. So this comes from uh, a study of gun culture that I started about two and a half years ago. Um, I was interested in sort of looking at guns for a few reasons, both sort of professional and personal. Uh, one was, uh, as, it, as it says there, sort of, I was, you know, sort of wondering why people feel so strongly about their guns, right? Like, why do they want to keep them? Why, why would they sort of do everything possible um, to sort of prevent new laws and things like that, right? To maybe raise the bar about who can, who can have it. Especially in light of some of these horrific shootings that we've seen in, in recent years, right? So that was sort of one question I had. It was also prompted by um, my own sort of questions. I'm a father, I have two children. Uh, my son was sort of becoming interested in guns and things like that as he was growing up. We had a policy in our house to not have any guns, not let him have any sort of even pretend guns. Um, but I found him you know, making guns out of Legos and sticks and everything, right? It's like once he got the idea, and I, I blame uh, the movie Spirit, the Disney movie with the horse, Right? There's this scene where uh, the young Native American boy with his four spirits on one side of a canyon and the sort of Union soldiers are on the other side. And the young boy doesn't know anything about guns really, right? And so he's just sort of sitting there not really worried because they're not that close to him. But they aim these things at him and they're able to like, reach out and practically touch him from across the canyon, right? And so he's like, oh shit, I gotta go, right? So he, he skedaddles out of there. Um, and I think my son saw that film and he was like, well, those are cool. There's something powerful there, right? So, so I wanted to sort of be able to answer for myself how to sort of ethically raise children in a world with guns all over the place where we very, very much celebrate guns uh, and that sort of thing. So, so those are a couple of the uh, things that motivated me to look at this. Um, I'm sort of the third little bullet point there, identity, masculinity, nationalism, and fear. Those are conclusions I've come to about why people <clears throat> 
you know, light guns and, and hold out of their guns as much as possible. And I'll say more about that towards the end, and hopefully I get to that. Um, so I'm looking at gun culture, right? And sort of the way in which gun culture intersects with policing, militias, and military uh, reinforces those things, perhaps, right? Um, <clears throat> and by gun culture, I mean, I want to just offer a sort of a vague definition, I suppose, but it's, it indicates anybody, really, who feels strongly about guns, uh, who consider guns a significant part of American life, Right? And that's both people for and against guns. Um, uh, you know, so what are the things I look at? Well, you know, I've, uh, I look at uh, images, which I'll show you a number of them, I'm looking at discourse around guns, um, and you know, of course, the production and dissemination and distribution of guns themselves. Um, gun culture is often viewed as conservative, as being supportive of the military and police. There's a lot of overlap there, a lot of police, right, they work with guns every day. Police and military are really the only sort of groups in our society who I can think of that work with guns, you know, every day. They carry them and, and constantly handle them. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap there. But in this uh, in this presentation, I'm actually focused on ways in which gun culture challenges, or, you know, uh, the police um, in part. Uh, but also, um, I want to note that gun culture is very diverse. It's not just one thing, right? But it's often seen as conservative. And what I would suggest about that is. Uh, it is fairly conservative, but it's also, there's a lot of people from sort of a, a spectrum of uh, ideological political, uh, points of view. Uh, it's just often the conservative folks just have the loudest voices and they're the most animated about things. Right? Uh, so we see it as, uh, as conservative. So I'm looking at the screen because I can't actually see, again, you see these gray blocks here, I can't see what's on my laptop for some certain reason. But, um, so what kinds of methods? I'll be very brief about this. It's, uh, I'm using sort of uh, ethnographic methods, um, both of physical spaces and uh, sort of virtual ethnography online, right? So I've gone to a number of different shooting ranges in Southern California, uh, also some other states. Uh, a number of gun stores, gun shows, um, to try to familiar, familiarize myself as much as possible with what you know real people who are interested in guns do and think and say about them. Um, also, I listed there are some of the different sort of websites and organizations I'm looking at for their discourse. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so some of the themes in the data. Uh, really, four big ones. Um, police, as, police being figured as unable to protect citizens. Um, themes around open carry movement, right? Uh, police as a threat, and then uh, militarized citizens. So I'll just get right into it here. Police as unable to protect. So this is an image that you can find, you can find all these things online. Um, it says, you know, 911 brings the guys who draw the chalk outlines. 1911 determines who they trace. Right? 1911, if you don't know, is a model of a handgun. Right? It's a it's 45 caliber, uh, usually, uh, handgun. That's pretty much what it looks like there in the image. Uh, this is by you know, National Gun Rights uh, work. Uh, right? So, you know, I'm going to show you several that are very, variations on a theme here, right? Emergency use 1911, 191. Right? Uh, and then they sort of break down the average response time for, for calling 911 versus that quote unquote response time two seconds of a firearm. Right? Uh, this is a, uh, sort of a Second Amendment uh, organization. This is actually the cover of a book that was published in the mid 90s called Dial 911 and Die. Right? Doesn't get more, that's not heavy handed or anything. Um, so, right, the shocking truth about the police protection myth. Um, and this was actually a screenshot at the bottom top uh, of someone on Twitter passing this image around, right? They're tweeting this image as they're sort of making the argument uh, for why you should own a handgun or, or some kind of firearm. This is another very sort of uh, dramatic uh, image when seconds count, police are only minutes away, right? That's where this sort of title comes from. This is that image of, right, the, the sort of the home invader, hell bent on, you know, death and destruction. And the only thing that will stop them is a firearm. Interestingly, this person is carrying in their home, right? I mean, they've got a firearm with a, with a you know, under the, under, under the pants holster. So that's what's actually called, this has become a thing too, home carry, right? Uh, it's not just like you have them in your home locked up, but you're carrying it in your home, right? So one of the ironies here is that, um, oops, one of the ironies here is that crime right now is at its lowest point, really, since the early 90s. So we, you know, I mean, this is, there's huge debates in gun culture around this. A lot of people would argue that's because of the ubiquity of guns now, right? 
Um, either way, whatever, whatever the cause is, there's less of a threat, it seems, right now for violence um, than ever before, and yet we have uh, a lot of sort of energy around promoting home carry, open carry, or concealed carry in public. Uh, moving to the next uh, theme, a right to carry or open carry movement. <clears throat> you probably have seen some of these images on the news or in uh, various media. This is a, a branch of Open Carry Texas, OCT, uh, in San Antonio, posing for a picture. Uh, many of them have various kinds of, it's hard to see actually, but many of them have various kinds of uh, sort of AR-15 style you know, uh, rifles. Um, this has become very, a very big movement in some places. Uh, there's another sort of image. If you take a bullet for your children, who would safeguard them from now on? You can't really see there, maybe, but that's a uh, movie theater. And this was probably produced right after the Aurora, Colorado shooting. Don't be a martyr, be a hero, go armed. Right? So go, go places armed. And this, uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about stand your ground. So let's be clear, right? This person's arguing they don't need permission to protect themselves, their family, or stand. This starts to get at the discourse in gun culture that frames firearms as a natural right, not a civil right even, but a natural right from God. Um, so that it sort of circumvents government, essentially. This graph is a chart, very difficult to see, but it looks from 86 to 2015. And with the most important part here, this green section are states that are called shall issue. And without getting into all the minutia about may or shall issue, it essentially has to do with uh, the legal criteria for a state uh, about how they, uh, how they distribute uh, concealed carry uh, licenses, right? So many states, if they become a shall issue state, the state has to issue the firearm or the license to carry a concealed firearm unless they can find some reason not to, right? Unless you're, you've got a felony conviction or something like that. But they have to do it. Um, as opposed to a state like California, which is a may issue state, right? where you have to make a compelling argument to the state, usually it's the county sheriff, about why you need it, right, for self-protection of one sort or another. And then the state can decide. So the shall issue movement, which you can see, the green has grown, right? So this is shall issue, this is constitutional carry, where you don't even have to have any kind of license. So like Arizona, Vermont, a couple other states. Anyone, unless you're a felon, can carry a, a firearm <coughs> in the states. So the green has grown you know, dramatically, right? Um, this is part of a trend across the country where the majority of states now have become shall issue states. So we've actually seen a, a, a tremendous liberalization of gun laws uh, across the country. <clears throat> this is a video I'm not going to have time to show, um, but you can find these online. Uh, and it's sort of making the point, a couple points I think, of uh, demonstrating the open carry movement and what they do, some kind of tactics. Often they will go and actually confront police officers. They don't have to work hard to do that because usually people call the police on them. If they're walking down the street with an AR-15 strapped on their back or something. Please show up. Um, there's several interesting things about these videos. Usually it's, it's white men doing this. They feel very entitled to be in public spaces with these weapons. Uh, and I just find it interesting like the way that they're often talking to the police. You could, it would be hard to imagine a man of color talking the same way without being slammed to the ground, maybe shot and killed, right? All kinds of horrible things. And a lot of these guys, they get away with it. It's actually astounding. Um, but if you're interested, you know, there's a ton of this online to find. But uh, police as threat. This image was shown just a few minutes ago, or, or variants on this image, right? One of the things we see is the, the militarization of police. Um, this is actually a gun, a gun club, uh, I believe, out of Dallas, um, Texas, the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. Um, people of color, mostly African American, organizing to demonstrate in public, very similar to open carry uh, Texas and other open carry groups, but around the issue of race and police violence, right? So what they're arguing is like, they're tired of being victimized and, and shot and killed. Um, they have a second amendment right, just like anybody else. They're trying to make that public, and they're actually, depending on which branches you look at, they're they're talking about the you know that sort of hands up, don't shoot. Their variation on that is hands down, shoot back, right? So they're sort of arguing for using violence against police to secure their own safety. I personally would say that's maybe a losing strategy long term, but but I understand the motivation. Right, last year we had 2015, 1,209 people killed by the police in this country. One year, right? 
it takes other nations several decades or maybe a century to, to get to that kind of number. Young black men are 21 times more likely than uh, young white men to be killed by police. And you know, criminologists and, and uh, other interested folks have documented significantly the, the sort of heavily, uh, the, the transition from police to sort of community policing to very militarized uh, policing uh, in that period. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump forward here, uh, thinking about militias. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to point out, and we just saw actually, the Malheur um, militiamen were all acquitted, right? Two of them are still facing charges in Nevada, so that's like an open question what's going to happen there. But um, this is part of it. Guns and gun culture feed this, right? Part of the idea that I'm working on here is how guns validate using violence as a solution to social problems. And people have various sort of takes on that, right? But you're able to, it's sort of a flexible ideology in a certain way. <clears throat> This here is, I think, important. Uh, attention, liberals. You have witnessed the proper use of the well-armed militia, right? Now you know why we have the Second Amendment. Of course, God bless America. This is uh, a sort of a meme that was generated and circulated after the 2014 Bundy Ranch standoff, where the armed supporters, like militiamen, oath keepers, three percenters, were actually able to drive back uh, federal authorities. Right? Um, federal authorities got creative and later nabbed Clyde and Bundy, who was the sort of elder, they, na they nabbed him at the airport when he was on his way to Oregon at the Malheur uh, event. So he's now in prison in a way trial. Um, the other aspect here is the way that gun culture militarizes citizens, right? This is an ad, it looks like for military personnel, but this is, this is for civilians, this ad. This is a civilian audience who's getting this ad, right? Using very militarized imagery. For, the ad is actually for this uh, site here, right? Not for the gun itself. Um, this is a, a great ad here from a, a company called Tactical Ship and Civilian Force Arms, right? Um, this is the New Patriot Starter Kit. For just $1,000, $9.99, right? You can get the AR-15 rifle. You can get the hat, the gloves, the armor, right, with the vest. This is armor here. Um, and have your New Patriot Starter Kit, so as you need to defend the Constitution, right? Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cut it here. Maybe we can talk more in the questions and answers. Um, but thank you very much for your time.